Um, my name is Benita Lettier. I am the Director of Producer Ed for the Nebraska Cattlemen. We are excited tonight to be hosting another Cattle Edge webinar, and our partner tonight is Multimen. Nebraska Cattlemen are working on several issues right now that are affecting our beef producers. Uh, we are busy monitoring um, issues, legislative and regulatory issues um, here in Nebraska and on a national level. We have several active affiliates that are starting to have more meetings. So make sure you check out our website to find out when your affiliate is meeting. And we wanna encourage you to get involved with those affiliates. We would like to know what you want us to work on. So if there's something um, that you uh, feel that the Nebraska cattlemen should be working on to help your operation, please let us know. And please let us know why your membership is important and how we can work harder for you. So just a couple quick housekeeping issues. Um, please ask any questions that you have along the way. You can type those into the Q&A box. We will be answering the questions at the end. So please at any time, go ahead and type in your question and you can find that icon down at the bottom of the screen that says Q&A. So at this time, I'm gonna turn it over to Hannah for a quick introduction. Thank you everyone for attending um, our multi-man webinar tonight in conjunction with Nebraska Cattlemen. My name is Hannah Garrett. I'm the technical sales rep for the state of Nebraska. Um, I'm new to the territory. So some of you I know I've met and some of you I haven't, but I'm making my circles and I'm sure we'll run into each other at one time or another. Um, we're excited to talk to you tonight about multi-man and specific applications in reproduction and vaccination of calves, which are events that are rapidly approaching all of us. As a producer myself, I've seen multi-man work for our, our operation as well as um, many others are in my area. So if you ever have any questions, don't hesitate to reach out to me, call me, email me anytime. Um, I'm always willing to talk cattle and multi-man and how I can help maximize the decisions that you're making on your operation. Um, with that, we look forward to sharing this information with you, and I will turn it over to Dr. Lawrence Havenga. He'll introduce himself, and then we'll get started on the talk. Thanks, everybody, for taking the time to attend our webinar. Thank you very much, Anna. And also, thank you to the Nebraska Cattlemen for uh, allowing us this time uh, with the most important people, the, the, the cattle producers. And uh, ladies and gentlemen, I, I'm a very simple guy. I'm a veterinarian. Um, I live in Fort Collins, Colorado. From the accent you'll hear, I'm not a native Colorado and I've been in the US for uh, 12 years now. I'm a native South African, but I became a US citizen in 2018. So I really don't know who I am. But uh, with that, I, I really wanted to, to focus tonight uh, on, on, on the breeding herd. And we're gonna spend a little bit of time on the calves when we get to the end, but you know, uh, when we talk about the reproductive system of animals and we talk about the immune system of animals, I find it hard to wrap my head around it. I'm a practical guy. I like, a, I like a wrench, I like a bolt, I like a nut because I can see it and I know how they work. Uh, so I thought we'd just kind of start off with, a, with an introduction, looking at something which we can wrap our heads around. Let's look at a little video and I just hope that the technology will, will work with us tonight. But once we've gone through that video, um, I think a lot of the stuff that I say uh, will make sense because if we if we don't really can you know wrap our heads around how these things work, I think we make it unnecessarily difficult for ourselves. So I'm gonna just uh, move one slide on and then uh, try and see if I can get this thing to work. And and I just want to ask, uh, firstly, Anna, can you see the the video on the screen? Yes or no? Okay. So firstly, I have to apologize because this, uh, this video I stole from a human deal. So it, it, it's not a, it, this is not a cow uterus and I apologize for that up front. But I think the, the, the fundamentals that we see here are the things I wanna share with you and the things that I wanna bring the, the mineral to how the cow actually ovulates, how she develops a, 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 an embryo, how she develops a fetus and how those things interact with the minerals. So I'm gonna kick off and just talk you through this, uh, this whole deal. 
when we talk, uh, you know, about ovulation, we talk about uh, the two uh, ovaries of the cow. We talk about uh, this deal right here, uh, which is the end of the fallopian tube. But most importantly, we're talking Lawrence, about the follicle. Yes. Sorry, I don't think we can see it. You don't think it's we can see it? It's just a link right now. It's, it's just gone what? It's a link now. Okay, so let me let me do this. What can you see now? There, now I can see it. Is everybody else? I believe that is, yep. Where inside the ovary is where we need to be. Perfect. Well, what I'm going to do is I'm going to back it up a little bit, and we can. Uh, there we go. Start from okay. There. Perfect. Uh, so so when we talk about the cow or the heifer, uh, you know we need to talk about the two ovaries and then this fallopian tube where really. That's where all the action takes place. Uh, and if we win or lose the battle for a pregnancy, we win or lose it in this fallopian tube. But let's just kind of quickly look at how this deal rolls out. You know, inside uh, the ovary is where the follicle, uh, the follicle will develop and eventually it's gonna, it's gonna release the egg. Now, I'm gonna stop this video and just talk about this development of this follicle. Because when we look at a, a breeding season, when we start the breeding season, we have already determined, at least for the first cycle of that cow, what the quality of these embryos, uh, these uh, eggs are, and these follicles are going to be. They take about 21 days to develop, and the, the dominant follicle will eventually release the egg. But during that process, we actually decide how good the quality of this egg is gonna be. Now, what are the three most important things that we need to pay attention to? The first one is energy. Because if we have a cow that's in a negative energy balance, if she's losing body weight, whether we have a drought, whether it's a cow that calved really late in the prior season, those things are all things that can negatively impact the development of this early uh, follicle. So negative energy balance is a bad thing. The second one is if we are very low in protein. Uh, if we don't have enough protein, it's going to damage this. And also, if we're too high in protein. So just be careful with your protein supplementation that we don't go too high. And then finally, it's the, the trace minerals. And unfortunately, it's not really the copper, the zinc, the selenium, the manganese that's going to impact this follicle. It's the enzymes that rely on that. I call them circuit breakers. So the, the cow has to produce those things once we give her the copper, zinc, selenium, and manganese. And that period of time for them to produce those circuit breakers, that period takes about three to four weeks. So if we address all of this, the day that we turn the bulls out, we're a little late. So we actually need to pay attention to this about a month to 60 days in advance of the actual breeding season. Right, let's advance this thing. And let's say we did a hell of a job up to this point. Uh, what's gonna happen now? So now we're gonna find a good quality egg being ovulated. Now, at this point in time, I wanna stop it there and make two comments. Up to this point in time, this whole ovary was under the control of estrogen. That's the hormone that makes the cow show heat. It's the hormone that uh, brings her on heat and actually gets the bull interested. And it's also the hormone that helps this cow ovulate. Now, once we have ovulation, you can see that we have a, a, a solid structure. The, the ovary is a little organ that we are now gonna punch a hole through it and release the egg on the outside. Now, I don't know about you, but when a, when a mosquito bites me, there's a little swelling and a little redness and a little wound there. The exact same thing happens on the outside of this ovary because we've just created a wound. And we need to find a way to deal with that wound. And that's sometimes where we lose the battle in maintaining a pregnancy. Now, let's say everything has gone well up to that point. Then this quality egg that's been produced is gonna enter the fallopian tube. And as I said in the beginning, this is where all the action takes place. So inside the fallopian tube, if the cow was on heat, the bull did his job, now we have sperm entering the fallopian tube. 
And once the sperm encounters that egg, uh, one sperm cell, only a single one, will get the opportunity to actually enter that. And then the two uh, sets of genetic material will exchange and combine. So that one sperm is gonna go through there, it'll combine, and now we have life. We have the first early embryo. And what happens now is all of these cells will keep dividing one into two, two into four, four into eight. And this process is very rapid. The cellular division here is fast. Now, there's one thing you can see here. I'm just gonna stop it right here. With all of those rapidly dividing cells in, you know, inside this early embryo, there are two things lacking. The first one is there's no food. So, so how do those guys stay alive? You know, what, what, how do they get energy? How do they get protein? How do they get their antioxidants? Where do they get that from? It all comes from the fluid inside this fallopian tube, which the cow produces. The second thing that is very clear from this is this is a living organism and there's no diaper here to catch refuse. So how, do, how, do, how does the cow clean it? Well, she cleans it also with the fluid that surrounds it. And that's very important because the majority of early embryonic loss that we get in cattle happens between, in the first 42 days of pregnancy. So everything goes well up to this point. But during this period of this early embryonic development, right up to implantation in the uterus, that's when we lose them. And why do we lose them? It is because we have a major lack of antioxidants cleaning these early embryos. Now, how do we make that worse? And, and everybody that AIs cattle and breeds cattle will know the answer to this. The two fundamental things that are super detrimental to getting a cow or a heifer bred if we keep everything else good, if we've got the body condition score good, uh, you know, we've got the protein good, we've got the minerals good, what are the two things that really wreck a, a good breeding season? The first one is really excessive heat. If it's too hot, if we heat up those females, we have a big problem. Because fundamentally what happens is the cow is trying to stay alive. So all of the antioxidants are used to keep her alive and to, to just manage that heat stress. And the level that is available to surround and clean up this embryo is too little. And we get that embryo just resorbs. The second thing that is really bad is if we combine that heat with humidity, because that makes a cow pant like a dog. So if we, if we increase the respiration rate of the, of the female animal, we really cause damage to this because she's using all of those antioxidants just to stay alive. So again, I wanna make the point, if we can come in early enough to get lots of those antioxidants into that cow, we may give this early embryo a little bit of a better chance uh, to survive. Now, if we've achieved that, it will eventually go into the uterus and it will implant in the uterus. But you can see that this sucker is growing at the rate of knots. I mean, doubling all those cells every division uh, it's a pretty slick deal. Right, now I'm gonna try and get this deal back to the slideshow and I think we'll be in good shape. So I just wanna stop this and then go here. Perfect, I think we're in good shape. And just give me a thumbs up if you can see the slide there. Perfect. Okay, and we're not gonna make this thing crazy complicated. We're gonna just try and go through it. I wanna just explain what you've seen just now in a different way. So if we look at it, we spoke about this follicle that needs to go outside. So yeah, so the follicle has to break through and now we have rupture. And why is it important to know that? because when a follicle ruptures through um, the membrane in that ovary, you need to have enough zinc, copper, and selenium in the animal to actually protect this thing. So we do not have two things happen. One is we do not want inflammation on that ovary. 
And two, we don't want this thing not to be able to repair itself because then we have a cyst. And then, then we start getting into fertility problems. The second thing we need is we need a lot of manganese. And we need the manganese because this ovary, uh, this follicle that has you know, given us the, the egg is changing. It changes into the corpus luteum, which now is a different hormone. And that thing produces progesterone, which keeps that pregnancy going. So I just want to show you what it looks like. So if we take a, uh, a, an ovary from a cow, this is where we're going to have uh, ovulation occur. It's going to pop that little follicle right through there. But you can see that that leaves a little bit of a raw wound right there. And that thing needs to be repaired. At the same time, that yellow thing there is the corpus luteum. That is where we find the most manganese in an animal because it is the, the mineral that helps cholesterol being converted into progesterone. So to maintain that pregnancy now, we need to make sure that that cow has enough manganese. Now we have that early embryo. So if we go back to the fallopian tube, how do they, how does that cow take care of that embryo? Well, she uses copper, zinc, manganese, and selenium to produce a lot of these antioxidants that actually help that thing stay alive and stay healthy. So that's enough of the science. Let's get into the practical stuff. Uh, I'm going to move over and say, okay, let's say we did everything right in taking good care of that cow in that 60 days before we started the breeding season. We got her to give a good quality egg. We got that egg fertilized. We got a good early embryo inside the, the uterus. Now we have a fetus that's developing. How does this fetus change the mineral status of that cow? Well, it changes it quite dramatically, not early on, but in a big time later on. In the last trimester, the last three months of pregnancy, the cow will take this calf and she will pre-stack it with mineral, copper, zinc, selenium, manganese, uh, cobalt, uh, calcium. She'll stack all these minerals into this baby calf. Now, how does she do that? Well, she will actually put them through these cotyledon caruncle conjunctions. They all run into the umbilical vein. And in the belly of that calf, that umbilical vein runs into the liver. And the liver is key for us to store these minerals. So I guess the question is, why would a cow pre-stack a baby calf like that? Why would she put so much into that calf? Because the problem we're going to run into as cattlemen is after calving, we're going to give that cow maybe 60, 80 days, but then we want to start the next breeding season. So if she puts everything into this calf, she's going to give us a little bit of a challenge when we get to the next breeding season. But why would she do it? Why, why does she put it into that calf at these very high levels? And the answer is actually pretty, pretty straightforward. If we analyze cow's milk, cow's milk is exceptionally low in trace minerals. So if she doesn't put it into that calf ahead of time, uh, when that calf starts suckling, he's not going to get enough. So if we look at copper, manganese, zinc, and selenium, it is just a very, very small portion of the daily requirements that goes into milk. So if the cow doesn't do a good job, we're going to run into issues with a calf. So, so what happens to a calf that's really low in mineral? There's a couple of things that can happen. The first problem we can run into with a calf is, is abnormalities. The calf may be born with joint abnormalities. It may have white muscle disease. It may actually die in utero and be born dead. Or if it gets born alive, especially the copper and selenium uh, in, in the calf is critical in the first three to four weeks of life to drive the innate immune response. The normal cells that that calf is born with to fight off E. coli, salmonella, rotavirus, coronavirus, the stuff that gives it scours that calf needs to have a lot of those minerals to fight off those pathogens in conjunction with the colostrum that it got. So if the cow doesn't put it in there, typical the thing that we see in very young calves is a lot of scours. And as they get a little older, uh, we see a lot of respiratory disease. Okay, now how does, how does the cow do it? So when the cow starts putting it into the calf, this is just a representation of, of copper. So, so the dotted line is the liver level in the cow. The solid line is serum or blood level. 
So what happens pre-calving is the cow just starts shifting this around. She takes the liver copper, shoves it into the bloodstream, and why? Well, because there is a hose connected to the calf. So she can get it into the calf uh, out of her liver. And as, we, as you can see, uh, she will keep stacking it, stacking it until she calves. Well, the problem is when we approach the breeding season, uh, now we have this problem where the liver is really low and the blood is low because there's no reservoir to, re to replace it. And that's our problem. If, if, if this really goes unchecked, we don't get enough cows bred early in the breeding season, but we get a lot of them bred towards the end of the breeding season and why? Well, they've just had enough time to repair themselves. If we give them enough time, they will repair themselves. And that's really where the, the injectable product comes in. So if we use it in a multiman or an injectable source of copper, zinc, selenium, manganese, how does that help? Well, it's a time issue with, with repro because if we can get an injection in there before calving, and really the data that we have today supports anywhere between 30 days pre-calving right out to break check. Uh, and what that does is it delays the heat that the cow takes at calving. It maintains her status and it gives her more to put into the baby calf. So you actually treat two animals for the, the effort of one. Then once, we, once we, we, we get to calving, I mean, a bunch of mineral is gonna leave that cow. If a guy tells you I can draw a straight line here, uh, that's BS. It just doesn't work that way. Uh, the calf is going to take mineral with it. So that cow is going to take a hit, but we can get in again, you know, 30 days before the breeding season and really set that cow on a positive trend and help her to breed back faster and more of them to breed back. So that's, that's, that's the fundamental deal about how we use the injectable uh, during the, you know, the pre-breeding season time period and again, pre-calving. We don't have to look at that. So when we look at a cow, what are the two key periods from a trace mineral point of view that we really need to pay attention and we really need to be on top of things? With a cow, it's really that pre-calving because we're impacting two different animals. If, if we do a sloppy job in the 60 days or 90 days before a cow calves, and especially if you keep cows on corn stalks, just be aware of this because it's a time thing, we don't think about it. But if we keep cows on corn stalks, and especially if you do a protein supplement that contains a lot of distillers or something, or even molasses that contains a lot of sulfur, just bear in mind, the longer we keep them on that supplement, the more we're gonna reduce their copper, selenium and zinc status approaching calving. So just be aware of that, that there's nothing wrong with it. We just need to know about it and we need to take some preventative me uh, measures uh, as we approach calving. So once we then calve out that cow and we've had good quality mineral in the last 90 days, that cow is gonna drop a calf that's well supplemented and she's gonna not be at a very, very low level. However, she now has to start producing milk. The calf's gonna suckle and she's gonna lose some mineral. And what we need to do then is about 60 days, minimum 30 days before we start our breeding season, we need to make sure that we adjust the trace mineral status of that cow. And, and, and why do we wanna do that? Well, that goes back to the video right at the beginning. Number one is we wanna have that first cycle. That cow has to have the best egg we can possibly allow her to, to give. And secondly, we really wanna give that cow the best chance to maintain that pregnancy. Because if she resorbs that embryo, it's okay, she's gonna cycle again. You know, if we have a three, uh, if we have a, a 60 day breeding cycle, we may get three cycles out of that cow. But the problem is we're gonna get these cows move out later. And that's where we don't wanna go. We wanna have our calves born early and in a nice tightly bunch group. So that's really where the, the injectable comes in and, and, and gives an advantage. The one big advantage that the injectable has is if you inject it today, you've supplemented that animal within eight to 10 hours. If we look at peak uh, liver levels or peak serum levels, they happen within eight to 10 hours. And by 24 hours, the mineral that that cow is not gonna use that day is gonna be stored in the liver for later use. So it's a very, 
quick way to do it. It's a fast way to do it. And I think one of the advantages that we just kind of glance over, but it's, it's a real advantage, is it bypasses antagonists. So if, if you're using distillers or molasses, it's okay. This product is given in, as an injectable, so it bypasses the gut completely. So it's not interfered with by any antagonist that you have in your diet at all. So it's a, it's a very nice advantage to have uh, with this product. All right. If we look at the heifer, it's just slightly different because she's, she doesn't come bred yet. So again, it's the same deal. We need to pay attention to her 30 days pre-breeding minimum, preferably 60. The one thing we need to just remember about heifers, and even when they've calved the first time, is they're still growing. So they have actually got a higher requirement than the cow. They do not only have to replace the mineral that the calf takes out of them, they're a little different. They actually have to have more because not only do we have to replace what the calf took out, we also have to put in enough there for them to reach their final, final body weight after that first calf. And then obviously we need to pay attention to these heifers again, you know, just before they calf in that 90 day window before they, before they calve out. So now we're gonna change gears and look at bulls. And I just wanted to talk a little bit about some of the things we run into uh, when we don't have the right levels in bulls. And I think it's really important that we look at these things because if we, if we, if we manage to damage the, the cycle of a cow, we really damage the opportunity for one calf. But if we have an issue with a bull, uh, it's a magnitude of calves. I mean, we're talking, you know, maybe 40 to 45, 48 calves that we've now put at risk, you know, so it's a big financial implication if we have something wrong with the bulls. So, so what, do, what does copper, zinc, and manganese do in a bull and selenium when we talk about uh, semen production? Uh, it's actually not just that simple. It doesn't just impact the production of semen. It also impacts the way that that bull functions. So when we talk about libido, the actual will of the bull to work, that's impacted by copper. If we have a copper deficient bull, he doesn't want to work. Uh, if we look at zinc, it's actually even more because zinc drives appetite. So we also see with zinc, we, we get a growth issue, especially in young developing bulls. If you're a seed stock guy, uh, just have a look at, uh, at zinc. It, it really impacts the way that those bulls grow. And because of the growth, it also impacts when they reach puberty and testicular size. And then manganese plays a role in abnormal sperm. Now, uh, if we look at when we supplement a bull, what do we supplement? If we give, let's say we start changing the mineral status of that bull today, whether you give an injectable or whether you put it on a fortified uh, trace mineral program orally and you feed that for a period of 60 days, what do, we, what do we impact? What do we have the opportunity to impact? We have actually got the opportunity to impact three different things. We can impact the, the semen that that bull already has manufactured. It lies in the epididymis and that's where it matures. Uh, it's just like a, a storage organ. That's where the bull stores ready-made semen. So we can actually impact semen that's already been made by just changing the mineral status of that bull. So we can do that. The second thing we can do is we can change the quality of the sperm that's actually being produced in the testes. And that's a good thing because if we, if we can help that bull to produce better sperm, uh, we have a better uh, risk of getting more calves. The last thing that we will also uh, impact is all of the fluids that are produced by the accessory glands. I mean, those of you that breed bulls or work with bulls, uh, you know, you'll, you'll uh, you know, you know, they have a prostate, you know, they have these uh, seminal vesicles, all of those things produces a fluid uh, which goes out with the sperm. And the purpose of that fluid is to provide nutrition. And secondly, to clean up the sperm and make sure that they keep in good health. Just like we have that stuff that surrounds that early embryo, we have the same deal in the bull. So by giving a, a better mineral status to the bull pre breeding season, we can impact those three things. And what that relates to when it gets time to actually test a bull is it changes the morphology and it changes the motility of those sperm cells. So we can change motility and morphology better 
by helping and making sure that that pool has adequate mineral status. And if we don't do that, we can actually impact both of those uh, the other way, negatively. Uh, so just where do these guys fit in? Uh, I'm just gonna go through this pretty quick. If we look at zinc, uh, zinc really is a key driver in the tail of sperm um, because zinc is part of keratin and the tail part of a sperm cell is 89% keratin. So it really drives motility. If you don't have enough zinc in there, you're gonna have poor motility. It, as we've spoken, it drives testicular size uh, and it also drives testosterone uh, biosynthesis. So the bull, uh, you know, willingness to work the libido that is also regulated by, by zinc. Selenium, selenium really plays a key role in the mid piece where the, the mitochondria is. And that's really nothing different than the motor that drives the sperm. You know, something has got to whip that tail, and this mid piece is what's whipping that tail. So selenium is key for driving the motor. So if we don't have enough selenium in that pool, what are we going to get? We're going to get a lot of mid piece abnormalities, mid piece breakages. And those are important things because if the motor is gone, it doesn't matter how good the rudder is, it's just not going to work. And copper plays a key role also in motility and sperm survival if you actually want to freeze it. Right, so when do we pay attention to these bulls? Well, it kind of depends on which type of bull we're talking about. If we're talking about a developing bull that we're gonna get ready for sale at some point, we need to start paying attention at weaning because the unfortunate reality is as a calf grows very fast, at weaning time is when we see the biggest variation between calves. Some of them have started to really hit the mineral feeder, some haven't. And we see huge variation amongst those animals. However, between weaning, they are now really running towards puberty and getting the testes active and getting the semen being produced. So if we can do something at weaning to harmonize that group, make sure everybody is on a good mineral status, I think that's when we, we really make a good difference. Then we need to leave them for about 90 days. And then we need to make sure that they're addressed again, because that's about you know, maybe 40 to 60 days before your final BSE. And we need to make sure that for that final BSE, they have no excuse not to pass. Uh, so I think, uh, you know, those are the two, it's kind of the two key points when we look at developing bulls. Uh, and I think it's, it's also important to recognize uh, not all minerals are equal in the bull as well. If we look at the young developing bulls, we did a, a pretty big study on 500 bulls coming in from different parts of the U.S., uh, into a cooperator developer just outside of Manhattan, Kansas, just north of Manhattan. And we looked at those 500 bulls and we, we bled them and we, we checked for which mineral really gives you a poor chance of getting that bull to pass its final BSE. Was there any mineral we could really single out and say, if this thing was low, you had a fairly good chance of that bull never passing. And the one we found that was well correlated with that was selenium. So if you have a low selenium, uh, at, at weaning, it really correlated very well with that bull not having a good chance to pass. So if we can adjust the selenium really aggressively from weaning towards getting that bull ready for breeding, I think we're doing a good thing. Then I think we also need to just, you know, kind of make one or two comments on breeding bulls. With regards to breeding bulls, it's a little different. This bull is mature. Uh, it's already working. Uh, so I think from that perspective, uh, we really need to pay attention to that bull anywhere 45 to 60 days before we start the breeding season. Because what do we want to achieve in that bull? We really want to achieve two things. We want to make sure that the sperm already there is in top top shape. So when we open that gate, we don't want an excuse with uh, you know, low mortality, low motility or low mor uh, poor morphology. And the second thing we want to really address is you know, the sperm that's still being produced because He's going to run out of reservoir and he's going to have to use some of the sperm that he's still producing. So by addressing that bull in that 45 to 60 day window prior to opening the gate, I think, again, you know, we're doing a really good thing by making sure that, that uh, the bull's mineral status is, 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 is well set up at that point. So with that, I'm going to wrap up. Uh, we've spoken about the heifer and the cow. Uh, I would like to, to make two or three comments about the calf. If we've done a really good job with a cow, do we really need to pay attention to this calf at birth? No, we don't. So if, if a cow 
was well supplemented in the last 90 days of her gestation. And if we, let's say we gave a multiman shot when we gave our scour shot 60 days before that cow calf, uh, do we need to do something with that calf at birth? No, we don't. If the cows came off corn stalks, they were on DDGs and we did nothing, do we need to pay attention to that calf thing? Oh yes, we need to really pay attention to that calf at birth. Now, just one thing, young animals are small. It's like babies. Uh, you don't ever take a pistol grip gun to a baby. Have you ever seen a doctor do that? If you have, get rid of them. But what I wanna say is, is a young calf is more susceptible to overdose. So when you, when you put that injectable or antibiotic or anything in a very young calf, read the label and stick to the dose. Don't think because it's a good thing to give a little more is better. That's never the case. Uh, if the label dose is set, the label dose is set for a reason. The one area where I feel we can really do good for cattle is that I'm gonna, you know, we call it branding, but the first time that we put a vaccine into that calf, uh, most people will do that anywhere between 70 to 90 days. And why is that? It's just that the window when uh, maternal antibodies from colostrum is waning. Now cattle are gonna get susceptible. And if we put a vaccine into them, it's actually gonna work. There's no maternal antibodies to interfere with your vaccine. So it's a very handy time, that 70 to 90 day window to do it. However, if we look at that calf that was born, that had really good mineral from the cow, when does that mineral run out in the calf? About three quarters of that mineral runs out about day 60. So this is the one area where we have about a 95% chance of putting a good vaccine into a horrible calf because we're putting a Rolls Royce vaccine into a calf that's really not good at responding to that vaccine because it's low in mineral. So this is the one time if people ask me, I'm gonna buy Multiman, I'm gonna use it only once, never ever again, never ever on a different animal. When is the one time that I should buy this stuff and use it. This is it, right here at Branding, or when you put your first vaccine into that calf. There is no downside on doing that. There's only upside, because that is an animal that I don't care how good your mineral program is. In 60 days, no calf is gonna eat himself into glory uh, when he's got his, the cow next to him. He's gonna live off milk. By that time, we're gonna need to find a way to adjust that mineral so that he can respond well to the vaccine. So that to me, this is, this is a non-negotiable time because this is where you're gonna make your money back. Having calves that respond well to that first vaccine is setting them up for a lifetime of health. Having them fail that first vaccine sets them up for horrible things in future. Because when you do a booster, do you booster them? No, that's the first time they then actually acknowledge that vaccine. And all responses after that is just not as good. The second time point where I see good value for multimen is at weaning or preconditioning, especially if you're going to spend the money to pre-wean and actually put vaccines uh, into these calves and, and, and if you're going to castrate them. So if you're in a value add program, uh, definitely the data that we've generated over the last five years show there's absolutely no reason not to put multimen with the vaccine at this point. And actually it enhances not only the, the individual calf, how they make use of that vaccine, but it also helps your population of calves so that you actually have more calves that respond good to the vaccine. So with that, I think I can shut up and attend to the questions. I see we have a couple there. So uh, I think if we, can, if we can do it, I've got them all four open here. So I'm gonna start with a top question. So the first question that I have here, it says, what is the ideal time frame prior to breeding to give multiman? Could I give it 60 days out? That's when we typically brand and work our cows. That's perfectly fine. The minimum time that you've got to give it, uh, we do a fair bit of research also in, in, in South America. So we, we, we do a lot of work on, on big numbers of cows in Brazil. And the, the, the closest we could go to breeding time where we still get a good benefit is 11 days. Uh, but the label on the product says 30 days and more. And the simple reason for that is the majority of data we've generated has been generated 30 days before. 
But if you go out 60 days, it's perfectly fine. It's not going to harm anything. On the contrary, it will actually uh, help with the early uh, uh, egg development as well. Uh, so I think that's perfectly fine if you give that product 60 days before you start your, your breeding season. So, so that should, should answer that question. Then we have a question. We test our bulls 100 days prior to turnout. Will Multiman help since spermatogenesis is 60 days? It depends when you give it. So if you, if, if you test them on 100 days before turnout, uh, you will definitely impact two things. You're going to impact the sperm that's in the bag at that time, and you're going to impact the sperm for the first cycle, which is 60 days, and you may actually also impact some sperm for the second cycle, uh, but not after that. So the product, uh, we'll get to that question. Uh, you've asked how long does the, uh, an injection last? Typically, uh, I'll address that in just one second. But I typically, I would like, if, if I, if I want to see the best boost in sperm quality and motility, we try and get it within that 45 to 60 day pre-use window. Then you, there's a question here that says, how are people incorporating Multimed into their AI sync protocols? Uh, there's two different ways to look at it. If you have a, a eight day seeder program, where AI is 11 days from the first handling of the cows. As I said, we have some Brazilian data uh, to actually um, support the use of that, uh, you know, when you start that program. However, the work we generated at Kansas State showed that if you give it 30 days before the day of AI, you actually get the best bang for your buck. In that uh, Kansas State study with a good oral program, combined with a, a single multiman injection at uh, uh, 30 days before AI, we saw a nine percentage point jump in uh, cows conceiving from that first AI. So I think that just answered that question. The data supports using it uh, 30 days before AI in a sync program. Then there's a question um, about how long does an injection typically last? So the 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 uh, answer to that is like a politician, I'm gonna say how full is the tank or how empty is the tank? And that's really the reality. If we have a severely deficient animal, if the animal is really low in minerals, uh, the, 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 the injection lasts about 30 to 45 days. If we have an animal that's closer to the normal level, that injection is gonna last anyway from 60 to 90 days. And in a normal animal, it'll last about 120 days. Then I have a, uh, I have a question here. I used multiman pre-breeding and a lot of animals developed a lump. What is the cause of this? There's a couple of things that can cause the lump with a product. So, and I really wanna ask what type of lump it is. So if you look at the lumps that develop the product is it's Multiman 90 because it contains 90 milligrams of salt. So if you do a good uh, sub Q injection, if you pull that skin away, you inject your product and you let the skin go, there's a couple of things that's gonna happen. It's because it's such a concentrated mineral, it's gonna draw a little bit of fluid and that's okay. Most people don't even see that because within eight hours it's, it's, it's absorbed. So it happens very quickly. If you have a hard lump developed there, it could be one of, you know, a couple of different things. If you get some of the product that actually gets injected into the skin, it'll make a hard lump because, you know, the skin doesn't like product being injected into the skin. If you use too long a needle and you actually go through the sub-Q area and you go shallow in the muscle, uh, that needle is going to cause a little bit of bleeding. And with that high concentration of salt there, you're also going to end up with a lump because now you have a little bit of bleeding and then all this mineral on top of it and it's going to form a little bit of a lump it'll it'll form a harder lump and it'll go away you know at some point the biggest reason for lumps though is 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 two different things one is where we inject too close to another product and there's a little bit of product mixing happening then you get a then you get a reaction underneath the skin which has nothing to do with either product or the cow it's just that these two things mix. So we're not, whenever I talk about how do we use Multiman, 
if you're using two vaccines and multi men on the same side of the neck, and please remember there's two sides. I know it's a schlep to walk around to shoot, but it really saves so much pain and misery if you can spread these things out a little bit. But if you, if you have to use multi men on the same side as another product, just always use multi men at the bottom because it is a very nice, thin, easy to syringe product. But damn it, it's like, because it's like water, it's gonna run. So if you inject it right above another product, the risk of mixing and developing a knot is right there. You know, the second thing is if, if cattle are wet, I don't ever like to inject cattle that are wet on the outside. Uh, sometimes if you do that, you carry some bacteria in there and it doesn't matter which product you use, you're gonna see, uh, you know, you're, you're just gonna see a little bit of a swelling there uh, when, you, when you pull something in there. Then I have another question here. How close can you give injections back to back if they are severely deficient. Uh, the data that we've generated is, shows that we do not go closer than 60 days. Uh, so if you want to, you know, if you have cattle that are really deficient, you can inject the product, give them a 60 day break, and you can give them another dose. And we never ever change the label dose. So even if they're deficient, we're not all of a sudden going to give them a double dose. You know, we may just follow up in 60 days. Uh, we do not ever change that dose. Thank you. And I think that takes care of all the questions. Perfect. Well, in that case, I would like to thank everybody for their time. I know it's late in the evening. Um, and my hope is that at least, you know, you found something interesting in this talk. And uh, if you have any questions, uh, you're welcome to contact us. Uh, it's very easy to get a hold of us. Uh, you can get a hold of us just going to our website, www.multimanusa.com. You can even find Hannah on that website. If you go to find uh, your sales rep, you can find her there. If you're from another state, you can find your local rep there and, and contact them. All the phone numbers, emails are on there. And if you just want to shoot a question to the office, there's always a vet here close to a computer that can answer your question. Thank you very much and uh, God bless and have a great evening and I hope it rains well this year. <laughs>